Well, thank you for that introduction, Samantha, and thanks for having me giving this talk and share some of the experiences that we had at White River Narrows. Tonight, the topic I've slightly changed it to places with rock imagery in the White River Narrows. I use the term rock imagery instead of rock art because um, many uh, Native Americans, indigenous people, among them the Southern Paiute, do not like the term rock art. They call it rock pictures or rock writing. And so for that reason, I use the term rock imagery. Then I also use the term places instead of sites. Sites are archeological places. They for uh, bureaucratic administrative purposes uh, where they um, do serve a good purpose, quite a handy tool to um, keep track of things. But a place is a bit different. It's associated with things, uh, the support, uh, nearby features, and then further landscape features. So it's something on the ground. And uh, sometimes uh, rock imagery places or rock art places for many indigenous communities are not always as much just about the, the pictures on the rock, the petroglyphs and the pictographs, but also maybe plants growing in the area, things that might have happened. Um, personages associated with the place, a myriad of reasons, historical things that happened there. And uh, so it, the place rather than a site and uh, the two don't always agree. A site is very much a, um, a spatial entity delineated for administrative purposes, whereas a place sometimes can uh, transcend a site. Now, the area that I'm going to talk about is the White River Narrows. I hope you can see the pointer there. It's the red star. And uh, that is in the uh, Paranagat Valley, or just north of it, the White River Valley. The White River empties in the Paranagat. It's the same river and then goes down into the Mud River and then empties into the Colorado. It is part of the Great Basin physiological area. The same plants, the same um, geology and uh, animals and so on, same cultural groups. But uh, because the it's connected and it empties um, into, it's connected to rivers that empty into the ocean, it's not part uh, geomorphologically or ge uh, geomorphologically land shape uh, wise with the Great Basin. Now, being this long corridor of river going in, I think, it, it, it allowed a passage of human beings going through from the Colorado Valley up into the interior. And it cuts through the Seaman Range at the White River Narrows. And here's an aerial photograph of the area. Uh, the winding canyon, as you can see, snaking through the Seaman Range there. Uh, these are all volcanic tuff that um, has formed in the area. And then the White River uh, has cut through it to create this canyon. And so far, there's, there are 10 sites with pictographs known in this canyon. And uh, the White River comes from the northeast going through to the southwest. And um, we decided for round 11 for the BLM to do a proposal to record and um, also do some acoustic studies and graffiti removal and a site called 210. And that's got four loci, known loci in it. We found a fifth loci in there too, but we worked at the four. And uh, there we did all the recording. We did the condition assessment. We did the acoustic studies. The acoustic studies were done in the whole narrows, the whole canyon. And then um, we also did then the graffiti removal at the low side one, two, uh, three. Now it's interesting that not all the available cliff faces or rock surfaces that you would think would have rock imagery on it, petroglyphs and pictographs, not all of them have it, just certain areas. And uh, so, and, and only of those certain areas, only certain surfaces within that areas and that concentrations have got imagery on them. So there's always a choice involved, especially where, become, where human beings are involved, cultural 
uh, mediated choices, influence choices. And it's interesting that the site here at the entrance, the southern entrance, site 21424 has got a lot of petroglyphs. It's, 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 it's what we'll call in California and also in Oregon, an entrance site where usually at the entrance of a canyon, you get a lot of stuff. Then it diminishes as you go in some of the sites and then it, it picks up again, which is kind of seems to be something in this area, in the central area, Loci, Locus 1, Locus 2. It's got really a lot of stuff. And then it tapers off to Locus 3. And then there's a Locus far, uh, a, a, a one at the north here, I guess you could like call it Locus 6. It's technically not in the, in the, within the narrows, it's just at the entrance. And we didn't record that. Uh, we hopefully will record that during round 13. And that's got the most imagery of all. So on either bookends of this wide river narrows, you get a lot of um, imagery. And then in the center, but in between, it kind of tail, tail, tails off. A drone photograph from the southwestern entrance uh, on the right hand side here, where you see. Uh, the White River coming out of here, uh, the, the old road going in, and um, then the Seaman Range there in the background. So this is where it exits the White River. Here's where it's ent entering uh, the, the northeastern entrance. And in the background, you know, Mount, you see Mount, Mount Irish there. Some of them you might know Mount Irish. And um, so this is what it looks like at the both ends. Um, as I said, it's not only about the imagery, but also about other properties of the area. Maybe there's water coming out, maybe there's special animals associated with it, special plant species, which can sometimes be the case. We don't know until we study it. But what we did study is the acoustics. And Steve Waller did the acoustics, and he was helped by Steve Dudrow. And I'm sure you, a lot of you will know Steve. He's quite handy with technical things. So he helped Steve Waller doing the acoustic recordings. And Steve's hypothesis was that um, the reflection, the echoes will be the most pronounced at rock art sites and less re now, uh, uh, obvious at sites that don't have the rock imagery. Um, sometimes I slip up and call it rock art. So just bear with me and I apologize if I do that because it's such a term that's with us. But anyway, but instead of that, he they found that the sound carries down the canyon, up and down the narrows. And um, for instance, yeah, he grafted out. Uh, he found that the, on the left-hand side that at 60 decibels, between 60 and 80 decibels, uh, sound reflected from non-rocket surfaces. And there's a bit more on rock art surfaces up to 85, but there's an overlap. So there's not a significant difference between rock art surfaces echoes and no rock art uh, echoes. But what he did find here is also that down the canyon, if you at one place with petroglyphs and say you were to pick the petroglyphs there, you could re yet at a site around the corner. So for instance, at uh, this site south of Locus One. Um, I've heard they're making loud noises, for instance, and the sound will reflect against the cliffs and you could hear it at Locus One. And before uh, the State Route 318 was built there in eight, uh, 1982, you could hear sounds coming from Locus One to Locus Two and so on. So we still have to test the, the site to the north there, the one that I'll show you right at the end, perhaps, if you make a sound there, it'll bounce up that hill there and you could hear it at Locus 3. So there's a communication and sound between them. And I don't know really what to make of it at this stage, but it's an interesting phenomenon where a sound doesn't travel as far in open areas. Now to get to the recording, I'm not gonna talk about the conservation, the, the graffiti mitigation as much tonight, but I'm gonna talk more about the recording. We recorded the sites at all levels. Uh, you saw some of the landscape photos with a drone. 
Then we zoomed into a site level. This is the biggest site, the amphitheater in the center, near the center of the White River Narrows. And it stretches over quite a wide area, as you can see here in the white. Um, it's got this lower bedding plane, for a lack of a better word, this lower layer of tuff, and then this upper layer. And the upper layer is far harder. So the, this side, the right-hand side of the amphitheater has got far more resistant rock than the, 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 the ones on the left here. And the division is somewhere over there where there's a rock fall. And the rock fall that you do get in the area is a potential danger if visitors come too close. Here you could see some of the, uh, the sign from the BLM uh, to notify people that there is some rock imagery in the area, some petroglyphs. Now this is a drone photo and also a map of the big amphitheater site. And um, you could see the, the ant nest here in the, the floodplain. The White River itself uh, used to be an above ground river during the pluvials, which is around about 8,000 years ago with high rainfall, but now it's just a trickling stream or a water underneath uh, the ground surface. Uh, some places it does come out at Paranagat Valley and also to the north, uh, but you get sometimes when with heavy rainfall it'll come down. And so there are areas where during where, where the water is probably more accessible. One of my hypotheses is that the rock art sites are associated with these areas where the water comes out or where at least it's closer to the surface. Um, you can see there's 17 panels here with some sub panels. Uh, because the old road came so close by, there's been a lot of graffiti because accessibility correlates quite a lot with the occurrence of graffiti. But then in uh, 1982, as I said, State Route 318 was completed. And so the road didn't go past there. And since that time, I think there's been one occurrence of graffiti in 2007. It, that date could be 1907, could be 2007, but that's the only later occurrence. And all the graffiti just shows you, if you make it more difficult for people to access sites, uh, it becomes better. Uh, in terms of uh, the chances of vandalism. Uh, this is the second site across the road, the pictograph site. It's a harder rock. And you can see uh, this one in the side valley. Technically, it's not really part of the um, same site, but in the site forms, it will be, it is numbered the same site and it's panel one. Uh, and a site being subdivided in panels. You can see it's got slight protection against the water, but it's a, a pictograph site and I'll panel and I'll show you the, the pictures later. And this is the main site just around the corner, not far from the state route there. And uh, it starts off with a panel really high up, very difficult to get to, and then lower down these various panels and going down here towards the right, where um, one's got to crawl in to do uh, the, 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 the pictographs in the big, when they did them. And up here, they had to climb up. And it's the same at the, the first site that I showed you that the things on the furthest right, you had to climb up to do it. And then at the right at the end, people had to kind of load down, lie down. And it's different from doing graffiti because graffiti usually, for the most part, it's either, seldom it's done high up almost never low down close to ground level, but it's usually um, as, as if a person stands at an easel and is painting, it's sort of at eye level uh, where you can reach the surface um, close, closely. Yeah, it's a bit different uh, that sometimes people had to do some bodily contortions and efforts to do this stuff. Here's a map of the, uh, that site, the pictograph site. That is the one that I said is in the side canyon there and most of them over here. As you can see for this site and then the, the, the amphitheater site, uh, we recommend they do a psychological barrier or fence uh, just to keep people away because it's quite accessible by road uh, today. And uh, at the other site, at the site, the, the, the first one I showed you, there they've got to keep the cattle away. This is the third site as you go into the White River Narrows. It's been heavily vandalized in the past and uh, some amateurs, I don't know, I call them graffiti vigilantes, they came and um, 
They remove the graffiti there. That's why you get those white marks. You can see it's quite close to the highway. Graffiti hasn't recurred in that specific place. Elsewhere in the valley, it's gone, but you can see it's quite a small site, even though, again, it's concentrated. It could be far more widespread. So it's interesting why it's just there. And then the fourth site is what we call the pink site. The previous one we called the Sushona, Sushona frog site. This is the pink site because of the pinkish color of the rock or the pink rock site. And again, it's close to the, the highway there, the state route. And um, there's been a lot of graffiti there, uh, which we removed with the help of uh, Steve and Ray, Ray Martin. Um, here you could see the drone photo of it. Uh, it's not far from the road and here's a close up. And what we found with the drone, is above the shelter. The shelter will be right underneath the cliff there. There is this uh, rock wall. It could be a vision quest enclosure, which they do mention sometimes in some of the ethnographies that people come up here, they do vision questing, and then uh, they might go down and do some of the, the drawings. This is the northernmost site, the one that we still maybe have to record, hopefully during around 13. It's a very elaborate site. Um, I know this picture looks a bit confusing. It's taken with a drone from right above. That's the cliff face against one of the panels where they did the petroglyphs. And uh, here's another cliff here where they've done it. So you come up the slope here and you see this little enclosure here, which could be another one of those. Um, you find them in other parts of uh, the American West too, where you get these circles and pavements and stuff where people went for vision questing. And uh, sometimes you won't, won't be that obvious because it's just an area where they cleared the rock. Um, now to get to the more the recording of it, the photography, it helps to get things at right angles, especially when you take close up photos. And as I would hopefully make clear, it's very important to take some close-up photos and then work back from that to the entirety. You work from the whole site to, to the panels and then from the panels to the individual motifs and how they are done. And it's important to do them at right angles because you get what, what is called a parallax. If something is more than or less than 90 degrees, you get foreshortening. And how to rectify that if it's a higher up, you get on a ladder or pedestal so that you get the 90 degree angle as, as much as possible. And what's not illustrated here is um, where something is sloping back like on a ceiling, uh, then you squat down or you have to lie on your back to take the photographs. So just a lot of photographs, preferably at right angles, and preferably, as I would hopefully also would make clear during this presentation, at different light conditions. Just to show you from a, this, what the simplest site here is the Shoshone frog site. Uh, before the uh, graffiti removal was done here, you can see it, it's a fairly small site there at the base of the cliff. Here you see it closer up. Uh, that photograph is to show also the sources of water coming down the sources of sometimes you might get problems starting right up there at the top, at the roof, so to speak, and that causes problems right here. So sometimes if you divert the water, uh, that might solve the problem. So it helps to get a, uh, a, a far off view of a site too. And as I said, also from the top. Uh, so you zoom in, uh, you get, closer uh, idea of what's going on, the different water flows. Uh, sites don't only, uh, the, the rock surfaces don't only differ uh, vertically, but they also differ horizontally. It's the different uh, water flows come down with different mineral salts in them. And uh, so you also get that the rock art is differentially uh, um, preserved or conserved because of that. And you can see the faint imagery there. And this is what we've added after the tracing. And as I will show you, this tracing has got to be done from really close up uh, to get the details. So the aim of this is to get 
a good idea from standing back of what's on the rock and where they occur. But then also, if you come in, you could see the fractal edges and then also what is associated with it. For instance, there's a little vulva shape there and it is centered on a vug, which is a little gas bubble in the tuff, a volcanic gas bubble. And the people focused on that with the vulva. Here's another vulva shape here to the right, which is centered on the vug. This is after we did the graffiti removal and also um, the camouflage to, to cover up the graffiti removal scars there so that it's not that obvious. And again, with the things, there's a little footprint there. And, uh, but now it's an oblique view, but we recorded that straight on, going in there with a camera and photographing it straight on, uh, because now these things are foreshortened, they kind of go away from you. Here's a straight on photo. And even these photos, we took individual photos of each and every one of these mountain sheep. There's like a little foot there. There's like a little paw print there, another foot here, the vulva shape I was talking about. And um, then close up of the one mountain sheep there. This is a tracing. And uh, this is how we did it um, from a photo that uh, the, uh, the blown up photo um, uh, enlarge many, many percentages so that you get all the fractal edges. And uh, in Illustrator, you can also do it in Photoshop, but we find it better at this stage to do it manually, especially where the things are overlapped. And there you've got to go and confirm back over to go back to the field and confirm uh, what you've done, your, your drawings. And uh, then you do the infill and uh, that's what you get once you've infilled. And you can see there's like a little line superimposed on it uh, that somebody put in later. Uh, and uh, also another way to do it is uh, with a drone where you can render, you can then do it in three dimensions because as I mentioned earlier on the parallax where the photos overlap, you get a three dimensional view of things so you've got two eyes that's why you've got three-dimensional vision if you've got only one eye you've got a flat vision and um, these uh, models that you can see in sketchfab uh, online uh, you can manipulate them uh, i'm not going to do that tonight because i don't want things to crash and stuff but uh, it gives you an idea of the surface while you sit at your computer, but the best thing is still to be in the field. But with people that don't have the opportunity to be in the field, they can do a virtual tour, which I think is a very good thing. And then they can view the thing from all sides and uh, then see, as I said, the vertical differentiation between the rock properties. You could see it going down. Uh, how the rock differs at the bottom is cattle damage, I think, because a lot of cattle graze there. They might urinate against the wall there and also scrape against the wall. Yeah, you can see to the left, that surface recedes a bit so they couldn't get there, but the mainstay where it's really accessible, they, they can. And then there's a bit of a, a, a bend in the wall, a rock here, and it's it, 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 different lichen growing there and then right lichen growing here on this side because of differential uh, rates of um, drying of the water and also maybe different mineral salts. You can see the rock here coming loose and potential hazard, you know, it can fall down at some stage. And uh, here's a, around the corner here, you could see some elaborate motifs down here and how the lichen just goes for the certain surfaces uh, where I would say there is a, a moisture sitting longer on the surface and also particular salts coming from the top. And so when, when we record these things, we also do a condition assessment, recordation of the condition and uh, see how that might interact also with uh, where people place their things. And you could see here where the cattle did the damage. We think it's cattle. I mean, that's the most um, parsinomious explanation because today you could still see pack cattle there and cattle paddies, uh, dung paddies. Um, so it's only the areas that are accessible to the surface that are accessible to cattle that you uh, find this damage. And the next photo, you can see where we've done the digital tracing and you'll see the difference 
uh, that the lower part you can hardly see. And to have, to have recorded that lower part, it was difficult. You had to do it under different times of the year, different times of the day. And uh, it's only on my last trip that I went over there that I found these images at the lower part here, the, 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 the circle with the dots in it, and then these meanders. And uh, this is through D stretch. And there's some stuff that I can't really decipher at the bottom. So we kind of left that out, not necessarily always put it in. But here you could see the right hand side of the panel. And uh, with all the detail there, uh, again, they sometimes used natural vugs as the center of, of the designs. Yes, concentric rings that they used like that. Here's another kind of vulva-shaped thing going on here. And uh, yes, they started pecking quite high up the wall. If I go back here, the pecking goes up there. And to get up to that level, you either had to use a ladder or standing on somebody's shoulder. So they didn't always go for the easy thing, as I said. And what they also did is they incorporated edges. Things disappeared in cracks. They go up the edges and disappear in cracks, or they go into a hole, or they focus in a hole, like you can see that one over there, that uh, uh, concentric ring design. And uh, then they've got other interesting designs like these um, inverted U shapes or arcs uh, that are interesting. And uh, they resemble the horns of the, some of the mountain sheep. Then you get these fine line inside stuff. It's almost like they've sketched like in pencil what they're going to do later because you get some of these designs uh, zigzag over there, sort of incised. And then sometimes they come in and they pick. And sometimes over the picking, they'll incise that, they'll engrave that. So. There, there's different phases to these things, starting off maybe with fine line and seizure, certain instances, and then with picking, and sometimes to highlight the picking, they will be engraving it. And this is the method I used to show the super overlap uh, of the motifs, and it's called the Harris diagram. And it's really designed for very complicated urban stratigraphy. Uh, that this guy, the British archaeologist, Harris, he found it in the Caribbean with historical sites and then also in Great Britain, where you get all these medieval sites and also some of the trade ports and stuff in Jamaica, where the, comp the, the stratigraphy is very complicated and the rock shelters too. And then, then in some of the panels, this is, this is not a, a complicated one over here, but starting with the earliest one at the bottom, which is the zigzags, and then the fine line, and then this peck thing that goes high up the wall there. Yes, more complicated stratigraphy. You can see those faint, very faint uh, arcs and zigzags below some of uh, later editions lines, and then this big line coming in. I always thought that intuitively the big line was done first, so to demarcate certain areas, like making a frame but that's not the case. And then this uh, thing up here. And um, also to show you some of the more interesting ones just around the corner of this complicated panel, where you see this um, mountain sheep uh, picked here, the behind quarters picked, and then the front quarters more solidly picked. These figures picked in there, what they call in toto picked figures. And, um, with some ochre applied later on. And then on the right-hand side, the Fremont style stuff, these are just around the corner uh, from that one. And uh, you can see these two eared figures. Uh, again, with ochre done at a later stage and only, only partly, kind of as an afterthought, you can see the zigzag coming out of a crack thing there. And uh, then um, also the vulva shape there, there's a natural, Vug or hollow there. Then they also made some cupules that they added. This is without the rock surface background. So you can see the detail is very fractal. So it takes a long time to trace. You can see a little horn thing here, traces of there 
of this figure, this figure here down here is superimposed on that one. And then they put some ochre on it, red ochre, and then size the bodies. This one looks like an extraterrestrial. It's got two little eyes here on the side and they all seem to be touching. And then there are these animal paws that you get at other sites too, that come up the site, up the, up the panel, up the cliff face. And you find that at a lot of other sites too. And then on the right, the Fremont stuff, there appears to be a little male figure here on a vug that's been worked on, little appendage here at the bottom, and then the female with a, a little uh, oval inside the body there, and then with a little very fine red horn on the one side there of the figure. And then uh, in some of these, you get these fine lines on top of them. This is just to show where the technique that we've developed here and at other sites differ from other places. This is an example of uh, in, up in Oregon, where people uh, did a rendered or recorded a, a, a stippled or pecked, stippled pecking uh, petroglyph. And this is done in the Columbia River style, which is kind of like the Great Basin style, but it's, it's got these big eyes and there are some differences. You can see down here, they've done the rendition of it, but it's cutting corners, literally, I mean, it's a straightening out edges. It doesn't give you an idea of the preservation, the fact that they've repicked the nose there, they've repicked the, the, the figure down there, and uh, there's also some repicking here. So um, certain things get lost. It's more time consuming the way we do, but once you've got it, you've got the thing as it is there on the rock at that date. So you can not only monitor what it is stylistically, but you can also monitor what his condition was because you can view it at different levels. You can leave, view it on the level of uh, seeing the panel from a distance, but you can zoom in and look at the micro details on the particular things. But there are exceptions. I mean, I'm going to show you now the central site, the amphitheater site, the most elaborate site that we did. And uh, starting uh, with the left hand where I said people had to climb up quite dangerous, these rocks now are loose. And uh, I had a special forces uh, guy from special forces that helped me do some of the recording. So he went up there, it was a one time thing to photograph a thing up there that I'll show you the, um, the tracing later. And then as you come down here, yeah, because the rock is softer, they picked in it too. You could see signs of picking, but then they engraved and they managed to go a little bit deeper. So it looks like just in grade, but it's back to, but they went up there to do stuff. And the things here yes, is still fairly straightforward. Here yeah, is how I did it for this report is a panel is um, all in that one, one a big rectangle. And then uh, the motifs that are shared are in the little block. So in this top panel, the top one that I showed you on the left, left side that you've got to climb up, that uh, the person who did it had to risk life and limb did this herringbone shape. I'm not saying it's a herringbone, it's just because it looked like a feather herringbone. We don't know really what it was, unless you get some maybe some indigenous uh, record of it somewhere. And then this meander up there, and then lower down in the panel two, you get these, and then straight lines as you move down these things become lower and simpler. And then as you get towards the center of the site, you get these more complicated stuff. Some of them still high, some of these fine line stuff that tend to be later. And, uh, but you also get stuff really low down that the person who's done that had to be quite uncomfortable doing that. And then the person up there had to climb up and really hold on and uh, do those incisions. And yeah, you could see the, the variation in the motifs, this little dot with the, the, the little dots around it. You get that recurring, there's meandering things you get recurring. Some things like this uh, plant looking thing is quite rare. 
the feather motifs seem to recur. And this is panel eight. You, as I said, it starts getting more complicated, but yeah, the cattle really did damage. So, so much so that we cannot really see what's going on here at the bottom. You get these fine line and stuff, uh, meanders at the top, which across the road at the pictograph site, they made some pictograph lines with uh, brushes or even dry pencil, maybe ochre pencil. But you could see the, the, the figures here with the vulvas. They've been incised, they've not been pecked. And uh, here you see a close up of one of those vulva figures. And um, they, they are signed that there was the vag here and they elaborated it and they went to quite detail to do this vulva here. And then later on, people kind of scratched around it. Uh, here is a a mountain sheep with this emanation or something attached to its back here. At the very, very northernmost site, there's one like that too, that hopefully we'll get to at around 13. You can see some superpositioning here. And then there's these fine land stuff that looked like graffiti, but it's not. Uh, you find these things in my Wyoming. You find it wherever there are Plains Indians. So I would think that at some stage, Plains Indians came and they visited this area. Here we find some other fine line inside stuff. And as I'll show you, the fine line stuff always uh, occur right at the end, either as preparation for later stuff or maybe Plains Indians coming in doing the fine line. Yeah, it's just a, for, for that panel eight, the different uh, classes that you get, the types. Now, People might differ to me how I classify this, uh, but the, 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 the advantage of the system is you don't have a description. You actually have the little picture uh, that you can then when, uh, virtually move around a virtual desk like you do an arrowhead or pot shed, and you can group it in any type of place. So like a gene with a specific sequence, you can then, it's open, for manipulation by whoever wants to work with it. But that is what it is at the time of recording uh, in its full detail. And uh, so I think that's an advantage of having these, taking the extra time of recording these things, looking at the sequence, looking where they are, but also having this available to researchers. And if you do a wide area where you can start uh, classifying things, uh, maybe train artificial intelligence, to group these things. And um, for instance, I, my, my eyes falling on these, um, I don't know whether you could see it, but sometimes up and down the cliff face, you get these imprints. Yes, bird prints. Sometimes you get deer prints. Sometimes you get uh, human footprints as if these things go vertically up the cliff. Here you get again, the sequence where you could see um, later on, they added these things on top of that mountain sheep. Uh, you can see that these footprints here, or the bird prints on top of these abstract designs. And, uh, but again, uh, where they occur, uh, the fine line is always at the top of the sequence. Uh, this is the very elaborate panel nine. Here you can see that the graffiti people, no horses there in fine line, and then 78, and uh, some more graffiti there. They did it where it's comfortable to reach, but sometimes, as I said, some of the rock art goes higher and some of them really low down. Yes, colluvial came in, it probably covered up some, some of the stuff. So it might be going down below the surface, the, the current ground surface. But uh, in other cases where you do get rock, uh, bedrock, it's very close to the bedrock surface. So there's no way of going lower than the bedrock. On the left hand side, the far left hand side, I don't know where you can see it, there are some of these uh, funny fine line meanders that you also get in the paintings across the road. So there's some sort of overlap. And uh, then you get these long lines running through and around the corner there, uh, little footprints going up the cliff face there. And most of the animals seem to be the mountain sheep, but uh, here's one animal here that you see is an elk and you see little dots coming behind its back there. And uh, this is just fo focusing on the elk where they incised its antlers. You can see it's on a, a crack here. The crack comes from the mouth area from the, uh, the head there, goes down through the body and another one going there. So it could be that 
they deliberately chose that. It's difficult to say. But in other areas, you sometimes get these so-called lifelines that they've incised. But what's interesting is the tail continues into these little blobs, these little cupules, goes on for quite a while. And then these cupules get these things around and go twist around like that. There's a natural hole of vug in the rock there. And then little dots around that that you sometimes get in the designs. So this is the most elaborate panel. It's the middle panel. It's the center panel of the site, uh, panel eight. And you can see the quite a lot of variety of stuff in this panel, including uh, the um, angulates, the mountain sheep, a lot of tracks, and uh, then a lot of other stuff that one can go on discussing. But uh, I don't want to go on too long about it. But uh, here's the Harris diagram again with the earlier stuff at the bottom, then progressively later with the fine line stuff at the bottom, at the top, and then the and ungulates at the bottom here. But there is one at the bottom, at the, this sequence here in this panel, each, each block here, each rectangle represents a different panel. But this one at the bottom, you see one at the top. So they call that an anti-symmetric relationship where in one case it's at below and another case it's on top. So then in those cases, the things in association that are overlapping are in relative terms contemporary. Then in other cases, if you get a fine line, say in stuff uh, uh, on top of a, um, say uh, an antelope or a mountain sheep and the mountain sheep is on top of a, say an abstract design. And the fine line never occurs on the, the, the abstract design, but it occurs on top of the mountain sheep. Then you could say that the fine line is um, later than the abstract design at the bottom. And they call that the, the transitive uh, rule in these things. So you can build up a master sequence if you get consistent overlaps and no exceptions. Yeah, it's quite an interesting panel just around the corner. I think it's called 9B. And it's got these very unique um, mountain sheep. You can see there the horns are quite long. And uh, then these weird zigzags and then fine lines right at the top. You cannot see so well in this rendition. And then also this um, arrow-like thing here, which again, very much looks like the stuff that you see among the Plains Indians. Um, yeah, you get some of those mountain sheep horn things too, abstract designs across this line that goes into uh, this crack. I've shown you this panel previously, but just because it's the next panel 10 in the row, I'm showing it again. And uh, this is the variation there, not as big as um, what at panel nine, and here you get the overlap sequence and here you get zigzags and stuff on top and other places you get at the bottom. So there is not really a sequence between different motifs. The, se the sequence seems to be more about technique where the fine line stuff is on top of the other stuff. And uh, here's 10, 10B, uh, quite a variation there. And uh, then I've shown you this one before on the left, and uh, so we could skip that. And uh, then uh, what I didn't show you is the figures, they've got the red on top of them, the incisions, and uh, the, the in total figures. Yeah, you could see the little thing on top of the other one. And uh, then um, not a lot of overlap between these. It's interesting that the Paiute that I spoke about, they tend not to overlap their stuff. Uh, they said it's, it's, it's people will come later and add things, but it's almost as if you, it's a commentary. It's very seldom that you overlap, but it seems that some of these things do have an overlap. Not that there's a lack of space, but it's almost as if they comment on uh, what's going on earlier. Then as you go towards the left, these panels become more, it's just on the harder surfaces panel from panels 12 onwards to um, 18. Uh, you find that um, they become fewer, they become different, they become lower to the ground. For instance, yeah, you, you, these are quite unique motifs up here. And um, then the semi-last uh, panel over here, 
we find closer to the ground surface. And then the very last one, the person we had to do that, there's a rock subsurface there, almost had to lie down or squat or sit on the, the person had to sit on their backside, back, I guess, to do that taking. So they could have stood up and do it over there, for instance, but they went down, they took some trouble to do that. And why is that bodily contortion necessary to do stuff? Okay, now we jump across the canyon across the, the, the state route there to get to the pictograph site where the rock is much harder. You can see it's got a ceiling, it's got an overhang. And uh, you can see there how D-stretch helps. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with D-stretch and how that helps. helps. Sometimes Photoshop works better. One's just got to try between the two. And you've got to photograph these things in the right light because if it's full sunlight, even if you use the best enhancement, you're not going to get it. Uh, you can see here what people did is they dipped their three middle fingers in um, ochre and then they wiped it over the, um, the rock. They dipped in ochre and you could see the, 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 the pointing figure, the middle finger, and then the, the ring finger next to that. And uh, so they made it in patterns and they did it on top of this fine line painted pigment. Uh, just to show you the one that's on the and the side channel uh, side uh, canyon this next to the White River Narrows, it is in the center. There is this uh, concentric ring. Then it's framed by two vertical cracks, and you can see the enlargement here. Vertical crack here, vertical crack there. Now, if you really wait for the right light, the shade, reflecting light from down from the surface, and you enhance it, you can see these faint red lines, dashes paint over the crack, as if they want to seal the crack. That could be one interpretation. And then the central concentric ring is focused on a little vug in the center there, a natural vug. And out of the vug are some sulfates, some salts that have come out. And then to complicate matters, somebody did practice with a 0.22 and they hit it there and hit it there. But if you, so they hit the ring there and there. But if you look at the center, it's definitely a vug and it's definitely salts coming out of it. So yeah, again, there's an interaction with the rock and uh, people, uh, the, the people who did the pictographs focus on that. Yeah, you can see the fractal nature, nature of the painting if you take the rock away. And it takes quite a while to record these because you've got to do all the ins and outs of it. Yeah, you could see these triangles on top of fine line painted earlier stuff that's now weathered away. This is the one that's really high up, very dangerous to get to. I don't know how they did it. Even the special forces person had difficulty photographing this. That person doesn't know how the heck they reach there, maybe with a ladder, maybe a tree that they rested against it, maybe standing on top of somebody. And uh, they did it putting their finger or thumb in poker and doing these paintings. You can see little dots inside of, the, of this figure so and a little triangle. So these things got details, not just stick figures. Then right at the end, remember I told you right at the end, you've got to kind of crawl in and uh, very difficult to see this stuff. You'll miss it if it's full sunlight. But in the shade, when you de-stretch it, you see this fine painted stuff, almost like ferns or feathers that they did in this rock shelter. Also weathered away a lot of salt and stuff accumulating over it. And um, just to show you the variation from the left, this is the side shelter that you've seen. And then the things that are next to each other tend to be similar. You get these little triangles, these panels, these zigzags, you tend to get here. And then you start getting an area where there's more simpler stuff. You get these crosses over there, these uh, trellis works. And then you get the super positioning, what I talked about, is where you get the triangles on top of the fine painted stuff. Then you started getting what I mentioned, the, 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 the three finger thing, the three middle fingers becoming more prevalent and uh, being superimposed on top of this net-like painted thing. Yeah, you could see here's a kind of a 
uh, curvilinear triangle if you get something like that, but you can see traces of it over here. And then the fingers done over that. Here the fingers have done in terms of an arc or inverted U and then done in a U shape like that. So there, there is some sort of a design going on here in some of the things. And sometimes it's kind of just arbitrary. A lot of it is um, also because I think of weathering in the, at the site. Uh, then you get you start getting the more fine line stuff here, like some finger paintings more, and then right at the end, underneath those alcoves where you've got to crawl in, you've got to lie down sometimes on your side, you've sometimes got to be on your knees, very uncomfortable, where you get these feather looking things right at the end, what I call ripples, I mean, for lack of a better word. Then going up to the northernmost site, uh, the, in, in the, within the White River Narrows called the Pink Rock site. Uh, you find that it's just really one panel, stuff really low down. Uh, this coiled snake here going over this um, mountain sheep. This thing that looks like an atlatl, I don't know whether it's atlatl or not, but this design. And then there's some pigment, red pigment in this vertical zigzag that they've incised. And then pigment inside, there's a, a, pig, uh, a zigzag pigment there. These things could be cattle markers that might not be a Native American, but we've included just to uh, earn the side of caution. We removed a lot of graffiti. This was really heavily graffiti. And Rhett and Steve really helped nice, out nicely here. And then as you go out to the, the right hand side, you get some really funny looking abstract motifs here. And then this uh, a zigzag with ochre info, kind of uh, like a chevron pattern. Um, in this rock shelter. And then just a summary of all of it, trying to group a together what goes together. And uh, there are some superpositioning. Again, interestingly, uh, the fine line inside stuff on top of the peg stuff uh, uh, with no exception. So the, that, that trend seems to be holding. Then a summary of all 50 panels that we've traced. I remember panels kind of like an arbitrary thing and they can, um, they really defined by natural edges and um, also um, as, you know other other criteria maybe uh, angles of, of the rock and so on almost a thousand motifs again what constitute a motif or an image some are composite so it's probably more than a thousand and uh, about 40 motif shaped classes again subject to different interpretation. But what we do have here, and I think this is very important, and even though it's time consuming, it's worth it. We've got a record of every single little thing that we could see, and some more. Uh, so unfortunately, I cannot show you this in because it's so the, the sheet is so big, but uh, this is a summary of all the motif types going horizontally and then site, different sites going down vertically. And you can see panel eight or nine, panel nine of the amphitheater site. You can see it's got the most classes and the most motifs. Here you can see the red sites. Uh, they kind of outlies a bit. And then the pink site is over here with uh, some motifs in there too. Then I did a, a, a presence absence Pearson correlation thing. It's kind of straightforward where I calculated the similarity, uh, straightforward present absence between uh, panels, groups of panels. And we found that panels that are adjacent are the most similar. And um, the red is all the ones with the pictograph, the black, all the petroglyphs. And so the pictograph sites tend to cluster nicely. And um, then also along this uh, axis that the sites in the bottom right hand corner will be the furthest removed from the, so the panel from the upper left hand corner. So what we found is the most elaborate panels occur in the central portions of the loci of loci one and two which was the, uh, the amphitheater site and the pictograph site. Uh, both of those panels starts high up and goes progressively lower as you move towards the right. The panels tend to thin out on the peripheries. 
The depictions of animals in the same panels, as you can see here on the left, tend to be similar style. As I said in panel eight, for instance, these things have got really big horns as opposed to some of the other panels. Uh, and you could see here at the bottom, uh, Locus 4, how the, the animals are fairly done in a similar style. Um, they're all facing the same direction in the panel, so there's some sort of a directionality to these things. And uh, incorporation, incorporating the vugs and cracks and edges in some of the designs show that the rock surfaces are important. And as I said, incised lines tend to be later. But interestingly, the painted fine lines tend to occur earlier. And uh, what is also interesting is that, as I said, some of the painted fine lines are similar to the later stuff that you find at, at the petroglyph site. So it could be that the paintings were done later than the petroglyphs at uh, the pictograph site, but that, that is just an hypothesis that needs to be tested. Now, this photograph is of the site that hopefully we'll be, be doing at uh, around 13. And again, the um, white outline shows you the panels, starting with a, quite an elaborate panel down here, and then getting more busier here in the center, and then fading out a bit here towards the, the, the right. And then some of these get quite high up. We'll definitely need ladders and uh, some rock climbers to get to some of them. And there's some around the corner that's quite high, but they get sparser and then more busy. So there is something of that pattern here, not exactly the same, but we'll see. I mean, uh, you know, you get an impression of a place and once you record it, sometimes your impression is modified. And that's one reason why we're doing this intensive recording. Yeah, you can see the main part of the one of the more busier panels. Uh, you get little uh, paw prints there that you get at some of the other sites that I showed you, some of the other panels. They seem to be older because there's more of the surface patination. I don't think this is desert varnish. This is different from the stuff you get on the, the boulders, but um, less of that surface crust or more of this surface crust developed here because of time passed. And then you get these later stuff that are lighter and uh, some of the stuff here towards the bottom that's more weathered. And uh, I would say a lot of the things that kind of look strange to us now will make more sense hopefully once we photograph each and every one and see how they overlap and stuff. And then that round the corner, another busy panel with what something looks like a big Antelope here, you could see its head going here. It's got kind of a funny horn-like thing twirling up here. And then its neck, front legs uh, over here, hind quarters back there, and the torso of the body. So uh, that's what it looks like now. Again, once you record it, it might be something different. Here's a little spaceship up here <laughs> that looks like that. So uh, Area 51. And there's some other things that kind of uh, look like the modern rendition of play stuff. But of course, uh, we know that is um, all made up. And uh, then um, another of these uh, horizontal lines. So we'll see uh, what's happening at this site, hopefully. There's gonna be a lot of work if we do get to do it. And just a final word, what's needed at these sites. Um, the final site has got a fence line there and the road doesn't go closely. So it's got graffiti has stopped there, but psychological barriers or maybe even a bigger barrier at the amphitheater site is necessary. And this is a photo taken by Jane Colber at uh, Chaco with a sandstone, even though the rock looks similar. And uh, since they installed this movable uh, road barrier, you can see it's got these concrete bases and you can move that. Uh, they've got interpretive pedestals here. You can go with a little uh, pamphlet and you can match it with a number. And uh, the motif sometimes is very difficult to see. So once you go certain times of the day to see these things, uh, sometimes they're invisible really. I mean, even when you know they're there, you can't see them. But the, the barrier is important 
because um, it, 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 in this case, it's shown, the proof of the pudding is that it showed that uh, graffiti, the vandalism has just dropped to almost zero where you find these rope fences. But sometimes they made a mistake where the rope goes really close to the rock surface and then you get graffiti occurring again. There's something about the rock surface being close and people just leaning over, picking up over rocks from the surface, the ground surface and just sizing a quick name, date or whatever. So uh, that is um, what I hopefully wanted to, well, what I wanted to talk about tonight and hopefully got across to your uh, what I think is important uh, for the work we did. So, but I didn't touch on the graffiti removal, um, but um, perhaps at some stage, but that's more a hand-on thing to do. Uh, it's like typing. So it's very difficult to explain in a, in a presentation like this. Thank you. Yes. So the first question, are the, avail are the photos of the superimposed glyphs available? They available, yes, they are, uh, I mean, we've got to get the permission from the BLM, from Jake and them. And mm -hmm. if they give that permission, we could share them, you know. I, I, I think they should be shared for study purposes. They should be shared for monitoring purposes, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Okay. And then of course they should be acknowledged, you know, that the, the, the source where they do come from the normal procedure. But uh, yes, I, I, I think if people want to use them, to do monitoring, to do research and, 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 and that kind of thing. Yes, they, they are available. And if I do provide them, I can even give the original illustrator files and stuff and, you know, but uh, you can zoom in and zoom out and, and, and get um, detail if you want for the particular ones. Cool. Um, so the next question um, is, in the main part of the amphitheater where there are glyphs close to the ground, it appears to be, it appears there is fill below. Do we know how far down the fill goes? Could we be, could there be other glyphs below the ground surface? Yes, they, they probably are. That's colluvial deposits. A lot of stuff has been brought down from the White River when it floods, even to this day, you know, things do accumulate. Um, so, yes, but I don't think it goes that far underground. But uh, there would be stuff, I would think. But, uh, you know, then you get permission to dig and, you know, that was the part of the thing, I mean. Uh, so our next question, uh, fascinating presentation, especially those charts. While watching, I was pulling up my photos from the site. It's a very special place. Yes, it is. <laughs> And you wonder why there's some other flat surfaces, why they didn't go there. They just went there. And the bigger surface there where they could have spaced stuff out, they didn't. They went over the other stuff. And, uh, and then at the other sites, they took great care to space stuff out. So it's just kind of interesting, all these, uh, all these variations. And... Uh, one would hope to get a chrono chronology out of it, but at this stage, it just looks like it's, you know, mountain sheep on top of the abstract, and in other cases, abstract on top of mountain sheep. So there's not a clear chronology yet. The only clear thing we have is the fine line inside stuff right at the top. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Does anybody else have any questions they want to ask? Oh, here. Those of us who visit the sites regularly do see patterns in the types of glyphs we see. Having the illustrations of the glyphs broken out by type and site makes it so much easier to identify the similarity. This is so much easier than flipping through the pages and pages of traditional recordings. I agree. Yeah, and if you have the digital ones, the, the digital thumbnails, you know, if it's a, a program like uh, at this stage, you know, illustrate or whatever, you can move them around like you do arrowheads. And, uh, you know, you might disagree with somebody else what the classes are, uh, what, what is similar or not, but at least the arrowhead is the arrowhead. Your, your, your trace figure is the trace figure and it's got all that detail in it uh, up to the point where you can say it's 
fine stippling or it's solid stippling uh, and uh, you know how much of it they completed how much it's weathered away um, so there's a lot of information in there that you can follow up and I would hope that at some stage that one can get a, a way and I think we will explore it, you know with round 13 if it comes around of, 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 of getting a quicker way of doing some of these things and eventually one can develop something like a, a rock or genome where you have all these little things, you know, from up and down the White River, you know, Paranagat, the Mud River, all, you know, from Ely down to, uh, uh, what is the place there um, in the South where it almost goes into the Colorado. Uh, but anyway, so you've got that whole stretch of river, which includes the Black Canyon and stuff. And you can see, you know, um, how it relates, say, to sites that kind of part of the same area, like shooting gallery, and uh, the, the sites just, you know, behind the, the first mountain range there, and uh, develop a more rigorous idea as to chronology, but also as to, um, you know, maybe even individual artists, you know, and how they moved around and stuff. That would be fascinating. So I have a couple of comments. So Frank Adams said, Yanni, great presentation. Good to see you again. Worked with you at Paiute Rock. And then uh, Rayette thanks, said, thanks, thanks. oh, and then Rayette said, uh, Steve and I were excited to participate in this research and learn more from your work. So I, I know that Rayette and Steve are on, were watching the presentation and they oh, were, oh. No, thanks, yeah, thanks to them and to everybody we helped and watched and uh, Steve and, and Red and, you know, with great help and, uh, you know, hopefully they, you know, we get around 13 and they can help it again. Steve's photography and Red's, you know, artistic ability, incredible, and uh, it's been a great help and uh, it's going to be a great help again. So I'm looking forward to working with them and uh, this time I think we will have the advantage of having representatives of the Paiute coming and being, doing an input in various ways. And, uh, you know, that's, that should be interesting. And new things might come out that we've entirely missed. Okay, and Steve responded with, we love you, Ronnie, Yanni, um, Samantha, and Rayette. So thanks, Steve. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't get what you said there. So. He said, we love, we love Yanni, Samantha, and Rayette. Same. <laughs> so, okay. Um, well, if there are no other questions, um, thank you so much, Yanni, for coming and talking to us and telling us about this. This stuff is incredible, and I'd love to see where it goes. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, and it, it's got a promise, and uh, yeah, hopefully it so. can be used in the future. Yeah, I, I hope so. I read your article that you wrote on it, and it was, I was like, oh my gosh, we have to share this with the stewards, so I'm glad Thank we you. were able to share it with the stewards so thank you again for for coming and telling us thanks for having me okay well then i will probably see you sometime in the near future i'm sure hopefully yeah. <laughs> okay take care bye. thanks a lot enjoy the weekend you too thanks bye